Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Ted Turner. Success leaves clues, kids. I just named five of the greatest names in business in the last 150 years. And they all have one thing in common. They're ball busters. They're hard as nails. Where does that leave you? See, in the real world, nothing comes easy. You have to put in the effort. You have to put in the blood, the sweat, the tears. If it doesn't hurt a little bit, if it doesn't sting a little bit, if it doesn't make you a little uncomfortable, you probably won't get very much out of it. If you don't feel like studying, sit down and study. If you don't feel like working out, lace up your running shoes and go for a run. If you don't feel like eating healthy, make the decision to choose the healthier option. When we make more decisions based on the place that we want to go, we allow ourselves to train our brains to know that we are in charge, that we are the ones making the decision, that this is our life. The official definition of self-discipline is the ability to control one's feelings and overcome one's weaknesses. Also, it's the ability to pursue what one thinks is right despite temptations to abandon it. The future is very expensive and only those who are carriers of discipline can inherit the future. I need you to stay motivated. I don't care if you have to listen to me a thousand times, I need you to stay motivated. And I need that motivation to mature into discipline. You had to work an extra job or two, but you're here. For a lot of you, even though you made it up the hill, you carry the baggage of rejection with you. But you're here. So many people are waiting. You're, you're waiting for things to be perfect. And I'm telling you, you cannot wait. You gotta start working right now. You don't get to choose how you start in this life, but you do get to choose what you do. Real greatness isn't determined by some birthright or fate. Real greatness is determined by what you do with the hand that you're dealt. Wake up early, put time and energy and effort into the things that matter. Give time to the people that matter. Raise your compassion, raise your drive. Look at what you're doing every single day. What habits are you holding on to? It's not about you being perfect. It's about growth and development and every single day that when you look in the mirror, can you say that you gave today 120% of you? Hard work will always position you in life for you to succeed. And I need you to believe in yourself. I need you to see yourself capable, lovable, and unconditionally worthy of your future. Everybody will try to put a limit on you what I've learned is that nobody can stop you but you and that you are going to have to break your own limit. Even though those moments may feel challenging, like the moment is just too big, like you're not enough to handle it, that's not true. You are able to overcome that, but it's going to take effort. I need you to open up your ears. Open up your ears. Because the you from the future is telling you thank you. Thank you for not giving up when you wanted to give up. Thank you for not being depressed. Thank you for not allowing the brokenness to eat your progress. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You got this. It's gonna get hard sometimes, I'm telling you right now. It's not gonna be easy, but it's worth it. There are key components and key ingredients in the recipe of a student mentality. Number one, you need to be disciplined. The future is very expensive and only those who are carriers of discipline can inherit the future. I need you to stay motivated. I don't care if you have to listen to me a thousand times, I need you to stay motivated. And I need that motivation to mature into discipline. I need you to be self-aware. So I need you to remember that you are always learning. In life, you are always learning. And I need you to believe in yourself. I need you to see yourself capable, lovable, and unconditionally worthy of your future. 
turn your pain into progress. I need you to see yourself. See yourself. One of the things that many students lack is vision. You got to see yourself before you get there. You have to hear yourself telling yourself thank you. I need you to open up your ears. Open up your ears. Because the you from the future is telling you thank you. Thank you for not giving up when you wanted to give up. Thank you for not being depressed. Thank you for not allowing the brokenness to eat your progress. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You got this. It's going to get hard sometimes. I'm telling you right now. It's not going to be easy. But it's worth it. Maybe you're listening to me right now you want to lose weight or you, you try to pass the final exam or maybe there's just this feat that seems as though it is impossible. Turn your pain into progress. Turn your pain into progress. I need you to be uncomfortable with average. I need you to be allergic to average. I need you to come to the end of yourself. So many people are depending on you. A student is hard working. A student is mentally tough. Have the ability to adapt. Have a character. Consistency. Demonstrate courage on the daily. Stay motivated. Stay positive. Earn your respect. Have a winning attitude. Breathe. Compete. Make no excuses. Set goals. Practice great habits. Stay focused. You want your future? You gotta outwork everybody on that field. You gotta outwork everybody in the room. You gotta learn how to perform under pressure. You gotta leave it all out on the field. <laughs> everybody wants the future, but everybody wants to be average. I graduated high school with the number four grade point average in my class. However, I went to one of the lowest performing schools in my state. I never had any homework, never had to study, never had to apply myself. I never was pushed. People always looked at me like, how do you make it look so easy? Well, to me it was easy, but unfortunately, that's the exact opposite of how the real world works. See, in the real world, nothing comes easy. You have to put in the effort. You have to put in the blood, the sweat, the tears. If it doesn't hurt a little bit, if it doesn't sting a little bit, if it doesn't make you a little uncomfortable, you probably won't get very much out of it. When I arrived at college, I quickly realized that I needed to study and really put a lot of time into it. But mentally, I just wasn't there. I was living way too reckless. I was nowhere close to being focused. Those poor choices led me to drop out and instantly, I found myself in survival mode. I heard a wise man say, if you fail to plan, then naturally, you're planning to fail. And what I take that to mean is, each and every day, you're executing some type of game plan. That game plan is either going to lead you to massive success or massive failure. And see, what the 18-year-old me fresh out of high school failed to realize is that it wasn't going to be easy. It was going to require me to be all in. It was going to require me to apply myself. Something I'd never done in high school. Something no one around me had ever encouraged me to do. And that's why I'm encouraging you dig a little deeper, to give a little bit more, to try a little bit harder, to go that extra mile and understand that the reason why you're taking those classes, the reason why you're trying to get that degree is because you are trying to design the lifestyle that you want to live. You're doing it for your future self. I will conquer what has not been conquered. Defeat will not be in my creed. I will believe what others have doubted. I will always endeavor to uphold prestige, honor, and respect for my team. I have trained my mind and my body will follow. Who am I? I am a champion. I will acknowledge the fact that my opponent, he don't expect me to win, but I will never surrender. Weakness will not be in my heart. Through all the bumps in the road and the stormy weather, the heart of a champion you can never measure. They might have more talent, but they fold under pressure because they were only out for the pleasure, the gold, and the treasure. They crumbled a better or even lesser competition. So today all of the excuses stop. This is where your heart of a champion starts. 
a worker, a believer, someone that understands that they got to do more than less, someone that knows what it means to push. Who am I? I am a champion. To my side I have comrades, comrades that have been with me through thick and thin, through sacrifice, through blood, through sweat, through tears. Never will I let them fall, never will I let them down, and I will never leave an enemy behind, because our opponent does not know my heart. Who am I? I am a champion. There will become a time when you have to realize that you got to put in the work and you got to understand that if you're going to do it, you better do it with the right attitude. Because attitude is what's going to take to get you to the level that you need to be and beyond it. A champion has to be disciplined. A champion has to be hungry. No one will deny me. No one will define me. And no one will tell me who and what I am and can be. Belief will change my world. It has moved continents, it has moved countries, it has put man on the moon. And it will carry me through this battle. Who am I? I am a champion. Defeat, retreat, those are not in my words. I don't understand these definitions. I don't understand when things go wrong. I don't understand mistakes, but I do understand this. I understand victory and I understand never surrendering. Because no matter how bad things go, my heart and my mind will carry my body when my limbs are too weak. You got to understand within you is greatness. Who am I? I am a champion. Who am I? I am a champion. Who am I? I am a champion. Today will be that day. So I'm here because when I tell you about breakthrough, I'm not talking about something I read, a college course. I'm talking about I've been through it. So here's the first thing I want y'all to know. This is the year of the breakthrough. This is the year of the what? This is the year of the what? This is the year of the what? Act like you hear me. This is the year of the what? This is the year of the what? Act like it. It's hard when you're in a library and you're studying and you read and you take the test and you get a 55. That's hard. So what I want you to understand about the breakthrough is that 90% is work, but the last 10% that's fight. But you mean to tell me I'm going to every class and I'm still failing? You mean to tell me I'm reading every paper I'm still failing? That's the hard part. The breakthrough is the hardest part because the breakthrough is not about the X's and O's. The breakthrough is not about the weight room. The breakthrough is not about studying the plays. The breakthrough, that last 10%, is all mental toughness. The last 10%, the breakthrough is not about being better than them. You're already better than them. You're just not better than them mentally. The breakthrough, I'm gonna break these boys. Why? Because where they come from, they couldn't get up at three o'clock in the morning if they wanted to. They smarter than me. They come from privilege. They got the language, they got the code, they got the rules, they grew up in it, but they will not get up earlier than me. They will not put out more content than me. Beast mode, one, two, three, beast mode, one, two, three, beast mode. I beast mode my way to number one. I need you to think about your dream. That big life dream. The people who dream and those people who dream big have a different kind of life than the people who don't dream. A winner is a dreamer who never gives up. Dreams require sacrifices. Like my city's expensive, move. My car payments are high, sell your car and take the bus. This is dreams we're talking about. We're talking about dreams. Whether it's fear or anxiety, whatever it may be, I believe that every single person who's going out to chase their dreams has those voices in their head. I think it's part of the human experience. Stop downgrading your dream to fit your reality and start upgrading your conviction to match your destiny. Stay strong, have faith, keep pushing through. I've said this before and, and I'm living proof of it is that on the other side of your struggle is something good. On your other side of your struggle is something better. On the other side of your struggle is some sort of success. Why would you waste one second doing something that wasn't progressing your dream? Go after this thing called life. Don't look back and have regrets. Understand that you're at a place and a position right now when hard work and Valuing people, nothing can stop you, I promise you. So your dream will cause you to go insane. 
Because what you want, it hunts you every single night. See the big dogs, they won't give you the opportunity. You're gonna have to take it. I need you to remember your destination. You don't realize your dreams are so important because your DNA, who you are as a person, is wrapped up in your dreams. No matter what happens, you will not quit because quitting is not an option because you have a why, you have a passion, you have a purpose. I have a dream. Your DNA is in your dreams. Be the example for the crazy dreamers in this world. You have got to make a declaration that this is what you stand for. You're standing up for your dreams. You're standing up for peace of mind. You're standing up for health. You want it. And you're going to go all out to have it. What you want exists. Don't settle until you get it. You need to use guilt as your fuel. You need to start feeling guilty when you're not achieving or striving towards your dream. You can use the people that doubted your dream as motivation. When your dreams are dying and when you don't have enough strength to go on, I need you to stop the procrastination. I need you to let go of all limitations. So I'm here to tell you today that you can have anything you want, be anyone you want, but you're gonna have to work. See, dreams, aspirations, they're not easily obtained, but one of the hardest things to do is to keep going, is to keep chasing. People will give up their dreams for certainty. But I'm telling you that your life will start to change when you become more committed to your dreams than your comfort zone. Stop being pushed around by the fears in your mind and start being led by the dreams in your heart. This is your moment. And you gotta look in the mirror and believe that. Ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. So take advantage of today. Take advantage of tomorrow. Take advantage of every opportunity that you have to do what you want in life. Life's too short to be working on someone else's dream. And I know it's difficult to follow your dreams. But it's even worse if you don't. You have to find a way to build your own dream or someone else will hire you to build theirs. If you give up on your dream, what's left? Because the people who accomplished their dreams in this world stopped telling people about them and started showing them. They never once gave up on a dream just because of the amount of time it took to accomplish it. No, they knew that the time was gonna pass anyway. Every single successful person that accomplished a dream will tell you that as soon as you truly start pursuing your dream, your life wakes up and everything has meaning. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. You were here for a reason. I know you're going through some hard times. I know life at times might feel rough or you might feel weird or things might be frustrating, but it's not going to always be like this. Your condition is not your conclusion. I've got to just take maybe five minutes to kind of just unpack my story so that you have an idea of who I am and why I speak with the passion that I speak with. There was a time when I was in a really dark place. You know, my mom had me when she was 16 years old. I grew up without my biological father in my life. I struggled with years for drug and alcohol abuse. And I just found myself in a really, really, really weird and dark place. I had to repeat the seventh grade. And when the eighth grade came around, I'll never forget hearing at a parent-teacher conference, a teacher tell my mom that I was a high school material. And I came to tell you that words are powerful. 
And when I heard that statement, I remember feeling like, wow, you know, like I am really, really a failure, you know? Like it's one thing to tell a student, hey, okay, you're about to graduate from high school, you're not college material, you're not gonna go to an Ivy League, maybe you should go to a, a, a tech school. Like I've heard that, right? Like different people have different paths, but, but how do you tell middle school kids that they're not ready for high school? Like it affected me. And I'll never forget going that next year and uh, after a series of events, a lot of fighting, a lot of struggling, that school ended up kicking me out. They got all bent out of shape because I cut the electricity off. <laughs> the next year I went to another school, got the report card at the end of the year, and because I did not do well and I did not put good in, when I got that final report card, all Fs, one C. And my mom is this tall, but when she gets mad, she turns into the Hulk, you know? And I'm thinking like, this is not gonna be pretty. But I came up with a plan. I said, you know what, I'm gonna change my grades. So I went to the library, I got that white out, I brushed off all the F's in the C, I took a fancy pen and a ruler, and I put those small little dots and lines, and I gave myself all A's and two B's. Then I made a copy of it. And as soon as I got home, I gave it to my mom, she took one glance, and was like, boy, where your real report card at? I said, mom, let me explain. She said, no, no, I don't wanna hear it. I know what happened. I said, you do? She said, yes. You probably lost it, how you always lose stuff, and you went to the office, and they had to make a copy of theirs on file. I said, yo, yo, you be knowing, mama. She's like, I'm no, I'm like, you know everything. She's like, I know. But at the end of that summer, at the end of that summer when my real report card came in, it was really rough. I never forget, like, when I first tricked my mom and she saw it, she was like, I'm so proud of you. She started crying. I even got emotional. I was like, I told you, mom, I'm gonna make you proud. She hugging me, I'm hugging her. We got like a breakthrough. And you're probably wondering, like, Jerry, why were you crying? Like, you know you didn't really earn all A's and two B's. Well, for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel like a failure. Like, I actually felt successful, like, worthy, like, I felt like I was good enough, and so I, that was a bit of an emotional moment. But it wasn't real because I didn't really earn those grades. Now, when my school sent my River Park car home and my mom saw it, she was in denial. Uh-uh, my baby made A's and B's, so she called the school. I was like, ooh, hang up the phone, mama, hang up the phone. <laughs> and again, she's in tears. But now, what was once tears of joy now it's tears of sorrow, tears of pain, tears of frustration. And she's trying to figure out, like, I wish my baby would just get it together and I was so hurt, but I felt stuck. I was depressed. I was tired. I was struggling. I felt like I was an accident. Like, what's the purpose of life? Like, why am I here? You know, I felt like I wasn't, I couldn't fit in. When it was time to read, I didn't want to read because somebody was going to tease me because I wasn't a good reader. We was always getting into fights. People was bullying me. Then there was a time when I was a bully. Like, I just struggled and I was like, what's the point of it all? And my mom's a great mom, so she moved me to another school. So now I'm at, my, I'm at the school now called Huntsville High. This is my third school for the ninth grade. Now I'm at this new school, and I don't know how to explain it to you, but I got a group of teachers, I felt like they were weird. They were saying stuff like, Jeremy, we believe in you. I'm like, me? One teacher was like, oh yeah, Jeremy Anderson, I've taught my man, ah, this is gonna be the best year ever. I'm like, okay. One teacher, I had to ask him, I was like, wait a second, y'all are way too enthusiastic. Did y'all get my transcripts? Like, y'all got the right Jeremy? They was like, yep, we got the right Jeremy, but you're in a new season now. So you don't have to worry about the past. I was like, yeah, but you do know about last year? Yep. I said, you know, this is my third school. They was like, we're not worried about that again, Jeremy. You're in a new season now. So let's not bring old things into a new season. And they began to speak life to me. They began to encourage me. They began to affirm me. And because I was young and I was immature, I kind of felt like, well, you don't really understand my story. You don't come from where I come from. And I try to build a wall up. But you know what knocked that wall down? It's love. You know what knocked that wall down? It was perseverance. You know what knocked that wall down? It was like unwavering commitment and support. And I realized you can be black, white, purple, blue, green, we need each other. And if you're showing up because you believe in me and you see great things inside me, like maybe, just maybe I could do great things. Your mindset, your belief system is everything. 
and it is so powerful. And so I came all the way from Atlanta, Georgia to tell you, you were not a mistake, you were not an accident, you were here for a reason. I know you're going through some hard times, I know life at times might feel rough, or you might feel weird, or things might be frustrating, but it's not gonna always be like this. Your condition is not your conclusion. There is so much more that's gonna take place, there is so much more power that's inside you. If you make up in your mind, I choose to believe that I can do great things. And I promise you, my young friends, I got to a point in life when I was like, man, I got these teachers, they must really care. Like when you start having teachers that get diagnosed with cancer, but they still show up to school. One of my teachers had arthritis so bad, she couldn't even write on the chalkboard. Other teacher was going through a divorce. Another one that just buried her child. I'm looking at all these teachers that's going through life just like you, just like me, but they kept showing up. So something inside my brain said, maybe I am worth it. Something inside me said, Maybe I can do great things. For them to jump through all these hoops and go out of their way to kind of connect with me, for them to make these sacrifices, maybe it is possible for me. It's the same way with you. Over the years, I have become intrigued and obsessed with the study of one of the most undervalued, underrated superpowers that exist in our world today. That is the study of the power of the mind. I don't think people really understand the power that they possess on a daily basis. It's a muscle that only needs to be exercised and once exercised, its potential is limitless. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Your mindset is how you set your mind. And every single day, we have a choice to move forwards into growth or back into safety. So be deliberate. Only you can change it. Use it well, and it will lead you to accomplish the incredible. Be deliberate with your mindset. Believe that you are in control of the outcome. If you can see it in your mind, if you can believe it in your heart, and have the courage to speak it, then you can pull it into your reality. So many people right now don't realize that our minds play tricks on us. Have you ever tried to go to sleep at night and your mind has been working overtime? Have you ever been walking down the street and thinking that someone is behind you? Our minds play tricks on us unless we make the conscious decision to develop a growth mindset, we will be lost and we will be a victim to a mind that has been conditioned to focus on what is wrong, to focus on what is missing, to focus on what we haven't got. Where does that change come from? Because is it enough? You want the change. You have new goals. You have new plans. Is that enough? The secret is to work on your mindset daily. Work on the way that you see the world. Otherwise, you'll live your whole life seeing the world through someone else's eyes. You'll be a creature of circumstance. You'll be a victim of your life and not the master of it. Read books, listen to audios like this one. Start learning about why you do the things that you shouldn't do and why you don't do the things that you should. It's all because of the way that thing between your ears is wired. But know this, you're in control of rewiring it whenever you make the decision to do so. At any moment, you can take control back of your life and start creating a life that you deserve, not a life that someone else has paved out for you. You got to understand that there are going to be many circumstances that will require your full undivided attention. You got to go through it to get to it. You have to understand it has to be a unique mindset. Setting a goal and then going beyond it. Realizing that there's work to be done. Making sure that all of the strings are attached. And make no mistake along the way. Now it's true that we all make mistakes and we will have many setbacks but there's always room for a comeback 
To understand this, you must realize that you must humble yourself, but yet be hungry enough to go after it with everything inside of you. Everything that is required depends on you. Having the mindset that regardless of anything that is around you, that is surrounding you, that is trying to drag you down, you must have the mindset. You must be strong. You must be resilient. You must be driven. And you must be able to take whatever's coming at you. If you stumble, if you fall, have the ability to get up. A winner is a dreamer who never gives up. It's important for you to understand that your experience facing and overcoming adversity is actually one of your biggest advantages. How strong is your why? It's not enough for you to just say, I want to do well. You have to believe that you will do well and you have to pursue it. You have to keep going when you run into challenges. Those who succeed are not fearless. They had to show up even when they were afraid. And I know it's difficult to follow your dreams, but it's even worse if you don't. You have to find a way to build your own dream or someone else will hire you to build theirs. If you give up on your dream, what's left? See, self-discipline begins with the mastery of your thoughts. If you don't control what you think, you can't control what you do. Your dreams are important. They are significant. They are valuable. They matter. You need to take your life, your goals, your inspirations, your aspirations, your desires seriously. Because if you don't, no one else will. You do have the power to create an amazing future. It's okay to rest. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to take some time to pull your thoughts together. But it's not okay to quit. See, self-discipline is the bridge between goals and accomplishment. Self-discipline is the magic power that makes you virtually unstoppable. Self-discipline is the center of the universe for success. Self-discipline is doing within while you're doing without. There are going to be times when you feel like you're losing your mind and you study for hours and you're going to take an exam and you will not pass. A student is resilient. A student is disciplined. A student is committed. A student is consistent. Why did you start in the first place? And what was the emotion, the feeling, what was the science and the psychology behind the decision that you made? And nine times out of ten, I can tell you why you started. You started because you were hungry. This is the year of the breakthrough. This is the year of the what? This is the year of the what? This is the year of the what? Act like you hear me. Every dream requires discipline. Every dream requires discipline. You are your only limit. Your potential is endless. Go do what you dreamed you could do. Believe you can and you're halfway there. Some of you are interested in this work and you like telling people you do it. It make you feel good. But you're not, you're not 120 though. Some of you are committed, but just like your side hustle. No, I'm just being real, y'all. I was fully committed. I left everything and started doing it. And because I was fully committed, the world responded to that commitment. But you just interested. You're not really committed to it. You're not putting in 50, 60 hours. 
when my wife got diagnosed with MS. I never quit doing the work because I wasn't doing it for people. I was doing it for the kids that I was doing it for. So even with MS, she had to quit her job. I'd take it to another level. Some of y'all are negotiating, not because of the company. You negotiate because you're not the best at what you do. And I need y'all to go back and be the best at what you do. And then I need y'all to come together as the best and then take this thing to the next level. And there's some of you, you know what you want. You know what you want, but you are not personally willing to do the work it takes to get it. What you're trying to do is do what you've done on this level and get the next level. You're trying to do exactly what you're doing on this level. You're like, I'm getting up every day. I'm putting in two and a half. I'm putting in three and I'm not getting the opportunity. The opportunity might require three and a half. I'm lifting weights. I'm eating right and I'm not getting the opportunity. It might require getting up and working out three and a half. It might require you saying no to your friends. It might require you changing your diet. It might require you moving to another city. Whatever it takes, you gotta be willing to do it and you keep saying you're not there because of something else because it's easier to blame somebody else. Because now you don't gotta do no work when you blame somebody else. Guess who gotta do the work? They gotta do the work. But guess who got the power? They got the power. How many of y'all tired of other people having the power? Let me see your hand. You want the power. I'm just being real, hands down. Hands down, think about what I just said. How many of you want the power? Let me see your hands. Good, write down, write down next to your crazy idea some of the things that you know you're doing wrong that's messing up what you're doing. Actually being successful or like moving out of our mom's basement or whatever, we put so much energy and time into the presentation of not looking like that's the situation instead of putting the energy and time into actually finding a solution to that issue. And so at that point, it was like, okay, I've been putting a lot of time and effort trying to pretend things are good instead of actually trying to find solutions. And then that's when I started to do everything I needed to do to try to make money and just really, when I say embrace, it's not necessarily like accept it for what it is. It's almost like, okay, this is real. I need to figure this out. Take in your surroundings, you take in the people around you, you see how they're making money. And I just didn't like begging people for money. And so I respected the guys that were like figuring out hustles, right? And so for instance, there was a, a Amico right down the street from me. And so I would go there and I would wash windshields and make money, just try to save up enough money to just be in a motel for the night. And I mean like the nastiest motel, but for me it was just, taking in my environment, seeing how other people hustled, how I can do it better. Um, someone taught me how to play drums on buckets and things like that. And so, you know, I just tried to do any type of hustle um, that I could. I just started to learn how others were moving and kind of adapted um, throughout. For me, it's, it's opening your mind and opening yourself to people. I think a lot of people, they are ignorant. They are like rejecting change. Travel, get out of your comfort zone, meet people from all different types of backgrounds. If you wanna build a product or service or company that you wanna build at scale and your friends are only the homies that you've been hanging out with since you know middle school, probably should meet some more people. Get to know them, travel the world. You know, and even if you don't have the resources to travel, the internet, learn about different cultures, learn about different people. You're at that computer, you tell me what you want to do. I tell you, this is how you search, this is, this is how you find those resources. Now you got to actually go and learn. You have to be able to show people that there's other options and that's what Spreading Seeds is all about. Showing people that they can actually do something different real now you have like these brief moments of kind of peace until like the next accident happens mm -hmm. right um, and that's just life in general you know it's never going to be complete smooth sailing one of the things that I've noticed about a lot of people is that they let the hardships and the things that happen in their life failure stop them from like Aaliyah said you know dust yourself off and try again right and for me I've just never let anything or anybody prevent me from achieving what I want to achieve. And so I've always had this relentless mentality. And if you say I can't do something, if I fail, if I you know mess up, 
it just motivates me even more. I just become even more hungry. And so I've always just had this, you know, relentless mentality. I don't take, you know, no for an answer. I don't take failure or accept failure at all. And it's just always been kind of in my heart to not give up. It's the rose that grew from concrete, right? It's like, no matter how terrible a situation is, no matter how bad it is, there's still gonna be a rose that grows from that concrete. And I feel like I was that, right? No matter what my situation was, I was built for this. I was not going to let myself fail, right? And I had that mentality. And I understand that now that I grew from that concrete, I'm starting to plant my seeds and there's more roses growing. What's so special about the internet now is really anything you want to do, you can learn. Like if you want to learn how to code, if you want to be a developer, you want to build software, you want to build apps, you can literally go on YouTube and learn how to code. And so what I would tell that person is, what do you want to do? Tell me anything. What do you want to do? Right now? There's resources and there's things online that can help you build yourself into whatever that is. So I think that that kid at the end of the day, he has to have that kind of just, mm, I got to make this happen, right? Here's the thing. No one can teach you that. At the end of the day, man, you really got to want it. You got to really want it. And I think the problem is, is now with social media before, when I was growing up, I didn't see all these examples of people having cool cars or doing cool all the time, like, right? And now with social media, I don't care if you're in like, you know, in the middle of nowhere, you can log on to Instagram and see just this whole world of experiences and things. The problem is, it's like, oh, well, these people have it, so I should be able to have it. And it's just like, man, you don't see the work that goes behind this, man. I started my first marketing job at 14. I'm 10 years into entrepreneurship. It wasn't until the past few years where I started really getting recognition for it, right? And so people don't see all that it takes to even get to that point and that's the problem. And so they think it's supposed to be this, this overnight thing goes, oh, I started an LLC, give me money. Right. No, that's not how it works. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint, right? You never know when that moment is gonna happen in your life where you're, you find that passion or you figure it out. The fun part is just trying a bunch of stuff. Like when you get to a point where you can just try a bunch of stuff, it's like, hey, sit down, make a list. I'm interested in all these different things, right? Okay, I'm interested in these top five things. Now, how can I do something that not only am I passionate about with one of these top five things, but also make at least enough money to just get by. You know the saying, you just gotta try your best. I would say that you gotta be the best. Is being top 20% of your class good enough for you? No. So if you want something, you gotta get after it and then you will start producing good results and then you will build confidence along the way. Let's just cut to the chase. Here are 10 study techniques that I swear by as a medical student. They help me get into medicine and I use these on a day-to-day -day basis. First, you gotta study from the testable core materials outwards. So let's say the box represents all the information that is presented to you and the star in the middle is the testable material. Someone who doesn't know how to study will go from top to bottom, covering every single little detail. And when the exam time comes, they haven't covered like 20 to 30% of what is testable. Whereas someone who knows how to study will start from the middle, you know, study from the core materials that is testable and then study outwards. And when the exam time comes, although they haven't studied everything, they studied what is important and what is testable. I know that you want to be the best student as possible. I want to be the best doctor as possible. So when studying, we have this tendency to try to learn everything. Um, but we have to make this mindset shift from focusing on those long-term goals to short-term goals. And those short-term goals when you're taking courses is to pass and get good grades in every midterm and every, every exams that is presented before you. And then those long-term goals will take care of themselves. So how do you know what's testable or not? There are three ways of figuring that out. First is to look for practice tests or previous tests. Sometimes the lecturers give you, you know, a couple questions at the end of their lecture uh, to go over on. 
pay attention to those. I also looked online in undergrad to uh, figure out if there were any practice tests lying around. Uh, I asked seniors if they've taken the course and if they had any practice material. I asked my friend who's also taking the course, you know, you, you gotta u use your resources to figure out if there are any additional uh, study materials that you can use. You have to think like an examiner, not a learner. So when you're going over the material, Always imagine in your mind, how can I test this in a multiple choice format? How can I test this in a short answer format? And then try to learn that way. Number two on the list is to write good concise notes and then plan out your timing for all your midterms and all your exams and then constantly evaluate as you're studying so that you're not falling behind. So for example, let's say you're taking five courses and before a midterm you have to go over 10 lectures per course. And then each lecture has 50 slides. That totals up to 2,500 slides that you have to go over before a midterm. So you have to write a good concise note that summarizes everything that makes it manageable for you to go over the materials before you write the midterms so that you're not overloaded. Try to write notes as concise as possible containing keywords and important information. You know that if you don't remember something from your note, you, can, you have the PowerPoint slides that you can always fall back on. Number three on the list is to use active recall when learning. I made a video on this previously that you can watch, but let me expand on that further here. Let me start off by giving you examples of students who don't know how to study. So when presented with an information like mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, what they do is without thinking, they just write. Nothing's coming into their brains. So what I do when I'm going over my notes is what I read the information, I write only the keywords. And then as opposed to looking at my notes, I look at that keyword, for example, what is mitochondria? And then I try to think mitochondria is the powerhouse, powerhouse of the cell. Why is it the powerhouse of the cell? And then I try to supplement information from the lecture. It is the powerhouse of the cell because it produces ATP. Um, so I'm using all of my senses. I'm writing down, which is my you know, tactile motion. I'm saying things out, which is verbal. I'm looking at my notes previously. I'm using my visual cues. And I'm, as I'm saying it, I'm listening, so I'm using also my auditory uh, senses. And most often, when you're actively recalling, you cannot remember all the information. And that is okay, because studies have shown that just by attempting to recall, you, you're creating that connection between the information and your memory. And number four, I cannot emphasize this enough, reviewing is just as important as learning new information. So if I have 20 lectures to go over before a midterm, for example, as opposed to going 1 to 20 and then going back to 1 to 20, what I do is I go to uh, 1 to 5 and then I review 1 to 5 quickly and then move on to 6 to 10. And then once I'm done 6 to 10, even more quickly I go over 1 to 5 and then I look over, look over 6 to 10 and then I go on to 11 to 15. Obviously you have to time this correctly before a midterm so that you actually cover everything. Number five is more of a mentality thing. You have to study harder for your midterms than your final exams. You're gonna obviously study hard for your final exam, but you have to study harder for your midterms because that sets the tone for the entire course. Let's say you got a bad mark on a midterm, then the entire course is just a catch up game. You're worrying the whole time, probably two to three months, uh, worrying about whether you're gonna get a good enough final mark so that you can make up for getting a bad mark on your midterms. Number six is having a strong mindset throughout school year. I'm gonna come across as a little harsh here, but you know the saying, you just gotta try your best. I would say that you gotta be the best. Is your best really the top 1% of your class? Is your best the top 5% of your class? If the program that you want to get into in the end has less than 10% acceptance rate, is being top 20% of your class good enough for you? No. So if you want something, you gotta get after it and then you will start producing good results and then you will build confidence along the way. Number seven is putting the work in and outworking everyone, which is kind of counterintuitive to put it in this video because this is a study technique video. But compared to someone who knows all these study techniques but doesn't work hard, um, someone who doesn't know any of these techniques and is just putting the hours in studying and getting the information into their brain is always gonna beat that person with better study techniques. 
I wasn't the brightest person in my class, so what I did was I just literally outworked everyone. How do I know that? I walked into a library before everyone else, and I walked out of the library after everyone else. I spent my time studying on Friday nights, Saturday nights when everyone was going out partying, and there was you know, one other student that was leaving the library at the same time late night, and he is now a cardiac surgery resident at U of A. So. Uh, things like that happen, so you just have to outwork everyone if you really want to be successful. Number eight is getting a serious study partner and friend who want it as bad as you. If you think it's gonna be hard to find them, well, if you start studying late nights at a library all the time, you tend to come across these guys. It's hard coming in early in the morning and leaving late at night, coming in on weekends. But in undergrad, I had a group of friends who I really studied with and we didn't really disturb each other. We, when, we, when it was time to study, we studied, we didn't interrupt each other. And when, it was, when the business was taken care of, we went out and had fun. Number nine is staying consistent and staying on top of everything, especially in medicine where there's like million things going on. If I start to lose track of things, I get super stressed. So I have to be on top of every email. I have to be on top of every, you know, assessments and all the work that I have to do. In undergrad, you're dealing with five courses plus your extracurriculars and everything going on. So you have to stay on top of things so that you don't fall behind and get stressed. Let me give you an example of consistency and why it is so important. You have student A and student B. You know, student A is working Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, 12 hours each. Student B decides to work on Friday, but takes Saturday and Sunday off. Then that student B has fallen behind student A by 24 hours. Um, so no matter how hard he tries, you know, the next on Monday, studying 14 hours as opposed to 12 hours, on Tuesday, studying 16 hours, that guy is always playing catch up to student A. And when you're on a curve in university and undergrad, you're just gonna not be able to compete against student A. Number 10 is effectively controlling your anxiety and your worry uh, when you're going through school. There are two types of warriors. One is someone who doesn't study and is worried about not studying. That, the solution to that is simple. You just gotta study. Number two, the second type of warrior is um, someone who worries despite having done all their studies. And when you're in that position, then you need to uh, write down what you're worried about. So on a notebook, on an iPad or whatever, you're, you're worrying because you're not seeing what you're worried about. So divide a line halfway in the middle, um, write down what you can control and what you cannot control. And something like what you can control is waking up early, going to the library and studying for X amount of hours and staying focused when you're studying. What you cannot control is the actual grades that I'm gonna get uh, from this course. So if I'm worried, oh, am I gonna get a B? Am I gonna get a B plus? Am I gonna get an A minus, A, A plus? You cannot control that. Just focus on what you can control and you just have to give up on what you cannot control. I bet most of your people who've sat in this chair, it's not about what college they went to. It's about their own initiative, their own drive, their own ambitions, their own curiosity. I can say from the era in which I grew up, I don't give a rat's ass what you say to me, okay? You can only be ridden if your back is bent. On my tombstone, I want the epitaph, be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. Many people look for meaning in life as though it's gonna be under a rock or behind a tree. Well, there's my meaning. You have more power than that. You have the power to create meaning in your life rather than passively look for it. Meaning to me is, do I know more about the world today than I did yesterday? That enhances meaning for me. And if that accumulates and, and accrues daily, in a month you, you know way more than you did than just that day later so that you continue to grow. My first question of me wasn't, where do I find meaning? It was, how do I create meaning? And that started early, early teens. You can draw a line in the sand between people who transgress, but do not hold power over you. This is a famous quote from Martin Luther King. You can only be ridden 
if your back is bent. When I grew up, it was very common to hear the phrase, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I haven't heard that phrase in a long time. I don't hear it recited in the elementary schools. What I think has happened over the years is we came to learn as a civilization that words can be hurtful. That's an advance in, in mental health. What I see on the flip side of that coin, however, is people are less able to deal with the very same people who are around today who were around back then, who are calling you names. I can say from the era in which I grew up, I don't give a rat's ass what you say to me. Unless you are between me and some goal, then I'll have to navigate that some way. If there's a racist person or a sexist person or a person with some kind of cultural bias, I want to know that actually. I want you to say everything you want to say. Then I'll say, okay, that's who you are. That's how you're thinking. So now what do I need to do because you're in my way? Do I dig under you, go around you, leap over you? Or do I go this way and then come out the other side? Yeah, it's longer, it's more effort, it's more energy, but on some level it's sort of same shit, different day. I can't say you're being racist, you're being, I, that's not, you gotta navigate it. I think high school, that's where you learn how to deal with difficult people. There are people who are nasty, you're gonna have to navigate them. There are people who you cannot interact with for whatever reason or another, they're gonna be in the cubicle next to you in your workplace. So I think we undervalue the total social pot that people are tossed into in their high school experience. They wanna say, oh, I could've learned more, but I had to deal with all these people. Hey, having to deal with all these people is now in your portfolio. Your motivation for the guests that you have in this couch, they, they had some vision statement and they have grit. Okay, they got knocked down, they stood back up, they tried another way, they got knocked down again, then they were successful, either measured by wealth or influence or, or just joy in their life's passions. For me, what I do for the public, 80 plus percent of it is driven by duty, not by ambition. That's how I view it, if that were the case. This is how I ended up hosting Cosmos in 2014. Anne Druyan, the widow of Carl Sagan, who was hugely talented, she approached me and said, would you consider hosting Cosmos? I said, I don't, there's a dozen people, maybe half a dozen others, who would jump at this opportunity. I don't need to do this, I really don't. And then I thought about it and I said, well, I met Carl Sagan when I was 17. I was applying to colleges, he was at Cornell. I had been accepted at Cornell, but didn't know what college I wanted to go to. And the admissions office saw that I wasn't totally in the moment there. They had forwarded my application to him for his reaction. And he sent me a letter. And I get this letter and I open it and it says, I understand you like the same stuff I like. Uh, do you wanna come visit the campus to help you decide if you wanna go to Cornell? He met me outside his building on a Saturday. Did something really cool. He reached back, grabbed a book off the shelf. It was one of his books. And he signed it to me. Neil Tyson, future astronomer, signed Carl. Later in the day, I'm ready to go back to New York. It begins to snow, as it does often in December in Ithaca. And he says, here's my home number. If the bus can't get through from the snow, spend the night with my family and go back tomorrow. I'm thinking, who am I? Why? Why? I'm nobody. But I was somebody to him. And I said to myself, if I'm ever as remotely famous as he is, I will treat students the way he has treated me. If we can fold this memory into this, this next cosmos, then we have a way to justify who and what I am as the next host, because a torch got passed. It wasn't passed in 2014, it was passed in 1975 to Neil Tyson, future astronomer. I still have that book. And what is a, an adult scientist? but a kid who's never lost the curiosity. I'll tell you the one thing that will build confidence you need to actually put yourself out there in this school year is letting go of what other people think and living your version of life. Because too many students are living a watered down version of someone else. They're living a watered down version of their friends, how their friends want them to be. They're living a watered down version of what their family pushes them to be or what society suggests them to be as opposed to being their own person. So go all in on you. 
whatever that may mean, what excites you, what, what pushes you, because our biggest problem, I believe, is that we compare our behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel. We compare our failures to everyone else's highest points of confidence, to everyone else's successes. We compare our insecurities to everyone else's highest points of confidence, then we feel like we're not enough. So go all in on you, whatever that may mean. The one thing that I don't enjoy about my job is that I come to a school, and when I was a student in going in to college, I didn't see myself as someone who could really make an impact. I didn't see myself as someone who could really contribute. It was only until I started putting myself out there, sharing my ideas, putting myself in uncomfortable situations that forced me to grow, that I became a beat that contributed to what made my school better because I was a part of it. Realize that you have the ability to make an impact. You have an opportunity to change that story in your head. Put yourself out there because when you do, amazing things happen. This school needs your leadership. They need your influence. They need your impact. It is time to show up. We're all carrying things in our pack. All of us are carrying these stories that are imposed by other people, by friends, by family, by society, by Instagram. And what happens is when we are faced with a challenging situation, we approach it with all of that stuff. Some of you believe the stories that you've made up in your own head. The story of I'm not good enough. The story of I'm not academically inclined. The story of I'm not a morning person. The story of I can't really make new friends. The story of I can't really have an impact on the people around me. And now listen, I want to be abundantly clear. I'm not the guy that's going to come in here and tell you what stories to tell yourself, but I want you to get back to the place where you can start telling yourself better stories. Stories that you are enough, that you are charismatic enough, that you are courageous enough, that you aren't like them and that's okay because you are like you. I believe when we stop believing the stories that we tell ourselves in our own heads, and start telling ourselves new stories, stories that are actually aligned with who we are and who we would like to become. That is when we are able to change ourselves and change the people around us. But I want you to raise the question within yourself of defining the snake in your life. That thing that keeps on coming up that it is time to face, because here's what I know. Every single person in this room, student and faculty, has something that comes up that tries to get in their way, make them want to quit and turn around and walk away. And what I know to be true is defining that thing for you is the only way to be able to overcome it. We talk a lot about leadership going into a new school. How do you show up as a leader in this school in the community around it? True leadership is leaning into the things you're afraid of. True leadership is consistently choosing courage instead of fear. True leadership is having the courage, the audacity to take on challenges, things that don't make you feel good while inspiring other people to do the same. It takes courage to make a new friend. It takes courage to stand up for that person that you see on campuses isn't being done right. It takes courage to wake up a little earlier instead of late, to join that student group, to put yourself out there more than you thought that you could. It takes courage to live a great life. So make the decision today of what courageous act are you going to make for yourself and the people at this school. It starts by taking on the things that you can actually affect, that you can control, and that you can impact because I see way too many students coming into college and university that allow themselves to be defined by what happened yesterday. They allow themselves to be defined by what happened last week. Some of you in this room think because of one failed test that you are a failure, when the reality is those are moments, not characteristics. And my personal belief is that we need to start seeing those moments for what they are, moments. Uh -huh. You went to IU, yep. right? Now you got a lot of people that uh, say, uh, forget about school, you know, they're drop idiots. out of school. They're, they're idiots. So you think they're, they're idiots. idiots. Tell me why. Um, if you're going to have and run a business, if you don't understand accounting, 
you're already behind the eight ball. Can't you hire a guy that's, that knows how to but run a But then they, they still have to communicate to you, right? I mean, there's people that don't understand the, the concept of, you know, the difference between profits and cash. You know, oh, your account might tell you, you're profitable, but your cash is going down. You know, not understanding um, the breakdown. And, and when you don't... You think you need college to learn that? Yeah, I think you do, right? Because it, it may not, for some people, look, if you're so self-motivated that you can take an online course in accounting and teach yourself everything, you're way ahead of the game anyways. But most people aren't. And I'm not saying you have to go to Indiana. I'm not saying go to an expensive school. I don't care if you go to a community college and take accounting and, and spend 99 bucks for the class. Just, you know, spending the money forces you to be more obligated to do it. But accounting, finance, lesser extent marketing, sales if the school offers that. These are all the, that's the language of business. And so while it's possible to teach yourself these things and while it's possible to hire them, mm -hmm. when you're starting your own company, you don't wanna to have to spend money hiring an accountant. And so your cost of opening up a business drops, but even more important than all that, that's, that's the blocking and tackling, that's the language of business. You know, the thing I learned at Indiana that was more important than anything else, I learned how to learn and learning became far more important to me because the one certainty in business is that it's always going to be changing the if, if you're not always learning if, to this minute if, if i'm not continuously learning if i'm not just absorbing as much as i can absorb someone else is going to kick my ass right so you're talking about paranoia the the greatest source of your paranoia should be knowledge if someone else knows more than you do and if you're not learning, if you don't know the learn, if you don't know how to learn, if you don't have a thirst for learning and acquiring information, you're you're SOL. You know, people like to say, you know, the only stupid questions are the one you don't ones you don't ask, and that's not right, right? Because the questions you ask tell me, tell whoever more about you than anything else you do. Because in particular, it tells me about your preparation. If you ask me questions about just basic things that you should have known and you should have down to a science that's gonna disqualify you almost more than anything. Do you think there needs to be a healthy level of paranoia? Oh, absolutely. There needs to be. Oh yeah, I okay. mean, I always say, you know, for every one of my businesses, I, I said, what would I do to kick my own ass? You right? So whatever business you have, there's somebody trying to put you out of business. There's somebody trying to, to take a bite out of mm -hmm. your business. Mm -hmm. And it's better for you to figure out how they're gonna do it rather than they do it. Um, and so yeah, that's being paranoid. And so you have to be paranoid. You have to anticipate other people's next moves and you can't ever you know, downplay the competition. Um, I was at a business plan competition this morning for, at a college and they were kind of being dismissive of the competition and so you can't ever do that. You know, they're out there trying to take you down and they're not just going to sit still. And if you're good, really, really good, you're going to inspire them to work even harder, faster, better. And so you have to be, you know, very self-aware of what you're good at and what other people are good at. And, you know, a healthy dose of paranoia makes a big difference, is very helpful. If you're not always learning, if, to this minute, if, if I'm not continuously learning, if I'm not just absorbing as much as I can absorb, someone else is gonna kick my ass. The, the greatest source of your paranoia should be knowledge. If someone else knows more than you do, and if you're not learning, if you don't know, the, if you don't know how to learn, if you don't have a thirst for learning and acquiring information, you're, you're SOL. There's certain guys that have the genetics to jump out of the gym, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's certain guys, you know, that, you know, when they golf, they have the muscle memory and, and the discipline. You know, Dirk um, Nowitzki may not be the most talented guy in the NBA, but his discipline and his focus to do what's necessary to be successful, he's willing to do and combine it with being seven feet tall and being skilled, you know, it, it makes him an amazing basketball player. So it's, it's understanding what your skill set is, finding the right place to use those skills and then going for it. You know, will that make you 250 grand? It depends if you pick the right industry. But whatever industry you pick, if you outwork everybody, if you try to be a little smarter than everybody, if you try to be a better salesperson than everybody, if you try to be better prepared than everybody, you've got your best chance because if you don't do it and somebody else does, you know, I have the saying, work like someone's trying to take it all away from you. You know, work, mm -hmm. I actually work mm -hmm. like someone's spending 24 hours, working 24 hours to take it all away from you. Mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of the way I look at it. If we would like to improve the quality of our lives, personally and professionally, what would be your advice? 
What can we do? What is most important? Well, the most important thing is self-esteem. Um, the people that we read about, the people that we uh, admire, um, the Elon Musks, the Steve Jobs, the Warren Buffetts, etc., all have one thing in common. They have extremely high self-esteem. Of course, you've heard me say this before, self-esteem is built the first seven or eight years of life. And uh, unfortunately, we're with our parents the first seven or eight years of life. Uh, ergo, uh, we don't have too much high self-esteem. But to build high self-esteem, and the way you build high self-esteem, if you're 25, 35, or 45, is to uh, be around, uh, surround yourself with other people that have high self-esteem. Uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And so uh, you can still, you can reverse your childhood by who you associate with. How do you do that? Well, you find people that are, that are where you want to be, but they're already there. You're 22 years old, you're 32, you're 41 years old, and there's a guy or a gal who's 45 years old who is where you want to be. They've accomplished a lot of things. If you're into, uh, they're saving the world, they're using their money for good causes, go associate with those people. Be around those people. And they're easy to find. Uh, but you, they're not going to knock on your door. They're not going to come to your apartment or your flat and ask you, oh, can I help you? And uh, the best tool I've ever seen, it's like it was designed for this, is LinkedIn. It's the best social media tool for what we're discussing. And uh, you can find these people. Now, just remember, everybody that's on LinkedIn, all the, I don't know, 20 million or whatever people that are on LinkedIn are all there for one reason. They're there because they want to do business, they want to meet people. Unlike some of the other social medias like Facebook uh, or Twitter. But I mean LinkedIn, they're there for a common purpose. They have a common bo uh, bond. They have a common goal. They want to expand their horizons. And it's a great tool. I had self-esteem. I didn't know till I got grown up and was an adult that everybody didn't have self-esteem. I didn't understand that. I didn't realize that everybody didn't have self-confidence. I didn't realize that everybody didn't have self-worth. Gallup did a poll in 2016, worldwide, 87.6% of all the people on the planet. We'll just, we'll just round it off. 87% of everybody that walks the face of the earth, 7.65 billion people are unhappy. The high-performance people, the one thing that they all have in common is they're hungry, hungry for a better life, hungry for change, hungry for the tough love their parents didn't give them. I wanted the poor kids to understand that they, they had a, a methodology, there was a methodology uh, used by one of them that was once poor and got in a lot of trouble. You can do it if you want to do it bad enough. The operative part of that little description is if you want it bad enough. Muhammad Ali, arguably one of the greatest fighters I've ever, he was talking shit since he's 14, 15 years old, I'm the greatest. Before he ever had a professional fight. My, my father said, if you've got something in, in your mind, it should come out of your lips. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And you've been taught all your life not to ask. You've been trained, keep your head down, don't embarrass yourself. Don't embarrass the family. Don't say things that may not happen. And I do just the opposite. I tell you to set goals beyond your lifetime. I, te I tell you to set goals as soon as humanly possible. When kids come to me, they want to make a million, 10 million, you know, and, and then when they've made a hundred million, they say, Mr. Pena, we would have never ever dreamt that we could create a hundred million until we met you. You will never exceed your highest expectation. You will never exceed your highest, craziest thought. Never. That's a guarantee.